Amen, 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 amen. Amen, you may be seated in the presence of God. Thank you so much, praise team. Amen, it's good to be in the house of God. It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. Turn with me to uh, Psalm 16. Turn with me to Psalm 16. And Psalm 15, sorry. And the Psalms are a collection of poems, songs, and prayers written by several authors over a long period of time. And today's psalm is a psalm of David. And um, its genre is an entrance liturgy. And this is the word of the Lord. Lord, who may dwell in your secret tent, who may live in your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even if it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, and who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things, will never be shaken. Father, we thank you for your word is good. We pray, Father, this morning, may the power of the gospel shine so bright in this service. That even as we come into your presence, we acknowledge that it's all by grace. You've called us by grace. You've saved us by grace. And you sustain us by grace. We do not have the capacity to, to live the way you want in our own strength. Holy Spirit, help us on our journeys. Help every man, help every woman. Every need that's in the house, supply. Every problem, provide a solution. Father, I pray today, Father, whatever is pressing on somebody's heart, I pray, Heavenly Father, that release divine solutions. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Give God the praise. My Bible talk this morning is, is entitled, um, Honoring God. Honoring God. A couple of years ago, the Lord gave me a definition of honor, and it's my first point. Number one, honor is the ability to recognize the value in a person, thank you, a place or a thing, and respond by adding value to the value you've recognized. So in order to honor something, there has to be two movements. The first step of honor is to recognize the value of that person. So when the Bible says honor your parents, you've got to see the value of your parents. If you don't see their value, you're not going to honor them. And then not only must you recognize the value, you must respond by adding value. Because value is, um, honor is not an imagination. There's a corresponding action of showing honor. And it's important in this time where there's a lot of dishonor in our time for institutions, for marriage, for parents, for, for your word. We need honor more than ever before. Amen. Number two, so to honor God, we must recognize the value of God. We must, what is the value of God? And we can't stop there. We must respond by adding value to what we have seen God to be. Amen. Number three, the next question is, how valuable is God? God is infinitely more valuable than anything in the universe. He's worthy of the praise and honor above anything in the universe. You saw when the rugby team won, how everybody was excited. When they won that victory, we started to place honor. We recognized the value of their of their team based 
um, on the victory they had won. And we began to honor them because of what they had done. God deserves honor, not even for what he has done, just the fact that he is God. The fact of being God alone, he deserves honor. He just, just by being his existence alone, makes him worthy of honor. But to make matters worth, worse, he has created this earth, this universe, every one of us. So we must honor him for what he has created. And not only that, we must honor him for what he has done through Jesus Christ. Through the cross, he deserves all honor. Number four, so to discern the honor of God, you have to study the attributes of God. Your homework this week is study 20 attributes of God. There's many more. But study the divine attributes of God. Study his omnipotence. Study his omniscience. Study his omnipresence. Study his transcendence. Study his immanence. Study his immutability. Study his infallibility. Study his aseity. Study his sovereignty. Study his providence. Study his holiness. Study his grace. Study his faithfulness. Study his love. Study his wrath. Study his purity. Study his, his foreknowledge. Study his sovereign power. You will never fully understand him. He's extremely valuable. Number five. In order to honor God in 2024, you've got to study the holiness of God. Father, we just honor you this morning. Forgive us for everything we put ahead of you. Forgive us for the idols in our hearts, the things we make more important than you, the things which occupy our time more than you. Help us, Heavenly Father, to put you first. In all things, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, look at your neighbor and say, God is great. Amen. Say, God is amazing. amazing. I wanted a friend, when we were preaching one day, he forgot his notes. For, so for five minutes, he just said, God is amazing, 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 God, and people are going crazy. God is a five minutes straight. God is amazing, God is amazing, God is amazing. And everybody just went crazy because God is amazing. He ran out of what to preach and he just said, I'm just going to say God is amazing. And the power of God still moved. Amen. Now let's look at Psalm 15. Psalm 15 is a short psalm. It consists of five verses. And I've divided the pericope of this psalm into three parts. Verse 1 is the question. And then there's only one stanza in this psalm. And that's uh, verses 2 to 5b, the answer. And then the final part uh, is verse 5c, the final line, which I've labeled the outro. So if you're looking at it from a song perspective, there's an intro piece. And then it's just one verse and an outro. There's no chorus, just a verse. So let's go to the introduction, which is question one. So let's look at this intro. And I'm reading from the NIV, verse one, where the psalmist opens with a question and is using synonymous parallelism, which means the idea in line A is repeated in line B, but by using different words, where David says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? who may live on your holy mountain. So that's synonymous parallelism. That's how Hebrew poetry works. They don't rhyme words. They rhyme ideas and concepts. So he's basically saying the same thing twice. Who may dwell rhymes with who may live. In your sacred tent rhymes with on your holy mountain. So in this question, we are then confronted with the genre of this psalm. Bullock and other scholars 
tell us that Psalm 15 is what is known as an entrance liturgy. And for us in the modern day church, particularly in a contemporary church like ours, we're not conversant with what the term entrance liturgy means because we're not familiar with the term liturgy. Um, the word liturgy is foreign to us, but it simply means a prescribed order, words, songs, scriptures, rituals or routines that form the order of a worship service. So an entrance liturgy in ancient Israel relates to how they enter the house of worship. So for example, our entrance liturgy is you, you walk in and the first thing you get is prayer and praise and worship. So part of our entrance, the way we enter into the service, we enter with prayer and praise. So in the context of the original audience, their entrance liturgy involved the use of specific texts in the Bible as a process as they approached the holy ground of the temple. In the Psalter, we got Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. Um, they serve as entrance liturgy. And in Psalm 24, for those who are Bible nerds, you'll find it very uh, similar to Psalm 15. In verse, 20, in verse 3, it says, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Him that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sown deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord, God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. That's how entrance liturgy works. There are two other examples of entrance liturgy. Isaiah 33, 14 says, The sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with the everlasting burning? Micah 6.6 6 says, you know, you know you're dealing with a preacher when they start the service. Let's turn to the book of Micah. How many of you have been in a service where they turn to the book of Micah? Amen. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? So to understand Psalm 15 then, as you can see that an entrance liturgy opens with a question concerning entering the presence of God. But in order for us to fully understand Psalm 15, we have to go into a time machine and enter the world of the original audience. Imagine you've traveled 91 kilometers from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Right now, that journey will take you about an hour, five minutes by road. Um, but in that ancient audience, it could take you weeks or even months. So imagine you've traveled 91 kilometers to Jerusalem because that's where the temple of God is. And you've gone there to worship. But before you even enter the outer courts of the temple, and because you're a non-priest, that's where you're going to stay. You're going to enter the outer court and you're not even going to be allowed in the temple because only the priests could enter the temple in the holy place and only the high priest could enter the holy of holies once a year. So once a year on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the priest would enter and go to the veil and apply the blood once a year. You'd enter only three times and it would be only about five minutes in the presence of God a year. So after you've traveled these 91 kilometers on foot, you're not allowed to enter the temple, you have to stand outside. But before you even enter that outside section, there is, this is where entrance liturgy occurs. Priests would read you a text, like either Psalm 15 or Psalm 24 or the other verses we read. So before you enter the temple grounds, you would first gather outside. And many times, all the time, you'd have to gather before sunrise. So you'd come outside the temple, and then gatekeepers would walk around you to inspect you, to make sure you are ritually pure and dressed properly. And during that time, 
as they are inspecting you to see, can we allow you in? They would be praying and praising God before sunrise. So you've got to imagine these people in the dark praying before they enter the outer court. Then as the sun rises, the temple, the, the temple gates would open. So as the sun is rising, they begin to open the gates of the temple. And at this point, before you come in the gate, the priests would recite um, an entrance liturgy like Psalm 15. So as the gate opens, you have to imagine the priest reading, Lord, reading to you, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain. Then after these verses are recited to you, you would enter and just be in the outer court. So if we bring this to the modern church, imagine that as this service started, every one of us at 5 a.m. were at the gate, right? On a Sunday, everybody, church starts at 6. So at 5, you have to be outside praying and worshiping God. So you're thinking joy is coming outside there. Because you're not allowed here. Here is only for bishops. I hear you here. But you're only allowed to be outside there. So we're all praising God. And then at sunrise, when the guard opens the gate, the pastors would not allow you in until they read Psalm 15 for you. And they would read it for you. And then you'd come in the car park, but you're not allowed in the building. You have to give your offerings in the car park, pray in the car park, you're not allowed because this is holy ground. If you come in here, you're going to die. Why? The answer is in Genesis 3, 24. After the fall of Adam, it says, God drove out the man and placed a cherub beam at the east of the Garden of Eden, and there was a flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the tree of life. Sisters and brothers, Adam's sin created a big problem for us. We couldn't enter the presence of God without going through a sword. So for men to reunite with God, men would have to go through that sword and die. So to address this problem in part, God by His grace instituted the Levitical sacrificial system, which involved offering animal sacrifices as a substitute to atone for our sin. So in the Old Testament, animals went under the sword on behalf of man so that man can fellowship with God. The animal faced the sword of the cherub so that man can fellowship with God. But when Jesus came, he went under the sword on our behalf. And he absorbed its best blow, death. And he overcame it so that now through Jesus we have access to the tree of life we have access to the Father and the sword can't touch us because he has taken it on our behalf so as you can see in this original audience access to God's presence was not something they took lightly they were not casual when it came to the presence of God because they understood that to access the presence of God, blood must be shed. And only the high priest can enter into the Holy of Holies once a year. So Psalm 15 as a psalm is meant to show us that worship is not cheap. It must always be done with a spirit of honor. There's a Greek word, thompo, right? Yes. It hits different in Venek. It, it captures honor. You know, when you say, I honor you, but Slompo like hits, it hits the spot. Are you hearing me here? Once a year, you could only enter the presence because worship is not cheap. It must always be done in a spirit of honor where we recognize the value of the holiness of God. The holiness of God is so serious that Jesus had to die. We need to place great value on how we enter the presence of God. Amen. And the mark of the sin nature in our hearts is demonstrated in two things. Lack of sensitivity to the presence of God and lack of reverence to the holiness of God. Yeah. A lot of modern day Christians are spiritually insensitive and spiritually casual. Yeah. 
There are two evils at war in our hearts after the fall. And uh, one is represented by Jacob in Genesis 28, 16, when he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. There are people who can come to church, and the presence of God is so thick in worship, but they are so spiritually insensitive, they can't sense his presence. It feels exactly the same feeling I have in McDonald's, I have in church. There is something wrong. Another evil in our hearts is demonstrated by Hophni and Phineas. In Leviticus 10 verses 1 to 2, who due to their lack of reverence of the holiness of God entered the presence of God and offered strange fire and the holiness of God killed them. The sword came out and killed them. We don't know exactly what they offered. But whatever it was, it was not what God wanted. Every time we come to worship, we must know we are not called to worship God the way we want. We must worship Him according to the way He wants to be worshipped. Because when we worship Him according to our fallen nature, we are offering strange fire. And it's the sin nature in our hearts. That makes man want to worship God by his own terms. I want to worship you through ancestors. My terms. I don't need Jesus. I want to worship you. I don't need the church. I can worship where I want, how I want, by myself. I don't need accountability. I don't need community. I can do it my way. And our terms will always be self-centered where our personal comfort and flesh are prioritized above God. If we are to worship God, it's important that we worship God according to His terms, not ours. God is the way that He wants to be worshipped. He showed us early um, in the Bible, in Cain and Abel, that there's a way He wants to be worshipped. He showed us very clearly, I don't accept every worship. There's worship I accept and there's worship I reject. And he told Cain in Genesis 4, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? When it comes to worship, we have to worship God on his terms or our worship will be rejected. And throughout Leviticus, you're going to see a, a refrain, a recurring statement which says, An aroma pleasing to the Lord as it relates to their sacrifice. Which lets us know that God has standards for worship. God has standards for worship. Worship must be conducted in a way that is a pleasing aroma to God. Aroma means smell. When God comes to our church during worship, the question is, is he smelling a sweet aroma or a disgusting, rotten odor? The same way the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 6, Lord, teach us to pray. As the modern day church, we need to start asking our heavenly father, teach us to worship. Teach us to worship in the way that you want us to worship you. Teach us to worship so that our worship is an aroma pleasing to you. Teach us to worship you in a way that deeply honors you, in a way that recognizes your value in a way that displays that we value you. Are you hearing me here? So verse 1 in the text is a question that teaches worshipers, before you enter the gates of worship, take time to look in your heart. Introspect and reflect about the condition of your heart before you enter the presence of God. This question is designed to disarm the worshiper of any pride or sense of entitlement as they enter the presence of God. Because it's asking the worshiper, who is good enough to enter the presence of God? Who is good enough to worship God? And the answer that comes, yet again, will show that as fallen men, none of us are good enough, nor have the capacity to reach the standards of worship that God really wants. God receives our worship by grace because a lot of our worship is still self-centered. 
I'm worshiping God so that he does something. I'm worshiping God so that he gives me. I'm worshiping God as warfare. I'm worshiping God so that he breaks the curse. Just worship God for being God. Are you hearing me here? And let's move now to the standard, the stanza, which is the answer verses 2 to 5b. After the question is asked, the answers come in uh, verses 2 to 5b. And when we look at the answers, we'll quickly notice that the items listed um, are not pertaining to the worshiper meeting the ritual requirements of cultic worship at the temple, but the answers speak to the worshiper's ethical requirements. Jacobson said, surprisingly, this psalm focuses exclusive on the moral requirements to the complete exclusion of the cultic, physical, or sacrificial requirements. Purity here is transformed from ritual-based to an ethical-based one, end quote. I would like to argue that this psalm is not concerned about how we worship, what genre, how long we worship, what songs we do, whatever. But it's more concerned about how we worship God in everyday life. The concern of this psalm is not how we worship God on a Sunday. It's concerned about how we worship God when we leave church. This psalm is not looking at how you worship in church. It's not, it's not, checking, to see, it's not checking to see how well you guys worship here. But it's checking to see does worship transform how you honor God and how you honor people. Psalm 15 is not cared about the outward expression of worship, but the inner life, the inner transformation that worship must bring within you. Psalm 15 goes beyond the outward expressions of piety within the church and penetrates into the hearts of worshipers. It wants to shift your focus from the rituals of churchianity and God is targeting his favorite spot in your life. He's targeting the condition of your heart because worship must transform the condition of your heart. So the question posed by this psalm serves as a litmus test to determine if worship is transforming your heart. Worship must transform your heart. It must change your heart in terms of how you honor God and how you honor your neighbors outside of a worship service. In that worship must increase how much you honor God. When you're saying, so will I, if you built all these stars, it must increase your honor of God and also it must increase your honor of your neighbors. In fact, Jacobson said, in this psalm, we see that God refuses to isolate his relationship with you from your relationship with others. Yeah. End quote. And that when God invites us into his presence and treats us with love, grace, and holiness, there's an expectation from God that when you leave my presence, reflect the way I treated you. Yeah. Reflect grace. Reflect love, reflect holiness to the people around you. Christianity is not an, isol it's not, it's not an isolation um, religion. God's divine design for us is not for isolation. It's for community. The Christian life must be characterized by bridge building, not building walls. There's demonic doctrines in the church of cut off this person. If they don't appreciate you, get rid of them. Everyone is a hater. Everyone is your enemy. Shut. There's this isolationist theology that's in the church today. We are called to lovingly serve people, not cut people off. This is because our Savior died alone on the tree so that... Liverpool, we will never walk alone. A savior who bore the heavy burden for our sins, he did that so that we can bear the heavy burdens of the pain and the struggle of people around us. He built a bridge between fallen man and a highly exalted transcendent God. 
He managed to build a bridge between the fallen condition and the transcendent holiness of God. And now he says, I want you to build a community of believers who increase their affection for God through the knowledge that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. There is no good thing about you that got you saved. It's by grace alone. You could be that very person who is on a scandal on the internet. That could be you. It's by grace alone we are saved. It's not by merit. There is no good thing in us that brought us to Christ. It is Christ who stepped into time, rend the heavens and touched your heart, regenerated you. And now at the cross, he hasn't just, he hasn't, your life is not just changing. At the cross, there was not just change. The cross is a place of exchange. The Christian life is not a change life. There's an exchange. The old life is gone. And you receive a new life in Christ. Our lives in this church must be marked by relentless fellowship and life-giving friendship amongst ourselves. Are you hearing me here? There must be unrelenting fellowship and unrelenting life-giving friendship amongst ourselves. It's what Paul describes as kononia in Philippians, which is a loving community with God and one another with the love, grace, and holiness of God that we experience in His presence, we begin to extend it to those around us. So in verses 2 to 5b, some scholars attempt to tie these ethical requirements to the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. But my approach is going to be based on organizing these requirements based on whom they are directed to. At this point, I would like to submit to you that these requirements come down to honor. The requirements in this psalm are all about showing honor. And my definition, like I told you in the Bible talk, is honor is the ability to recognize value and respond by adding value you've recognized. Anything you dishonor, you're not recognizing its value. I was in Geneva over the holiday and I was amazed by just the cleanliness of the city. I did not see any litter in the CBD. And then when I came back, Johannesburg CBD is Gotham City. Why? We don't see the value of our city. We don't see the value of putting litter in the bin. So we can litter, we don't see the value. So we don't honor our city enough. Are you hearing me here? So in these verses, we will see ways to show honor vertically. There's vertical honor that we show to God. And then there's horizontal honor which we show to our neighbors in our everyday life. So verse 2 is vertical honor that's shown to God when it says, The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, these three requirements can only come from someone who is seeking to honor God by living a holy life. To be blameless also means to live a holy life, not only in church, but away from church. It's important that we need Christians who live a holy life, not just in church. The real litmus test is Monday to Saturday. Reflect the God you serve when no one else is watching. And many times, secret sin shows you fear men more than you fear God. God is watching you all the time, and you don't mind. But when people are not watching, you're more excited. And the truth about it is, our holy life cannot be done in our own strength. It's by grace. 
We have to look to Jesus and put our trust in Him and believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, He will give us the grace to live a life that is holy before Him and men. Because holiness is hard and impossible in human strength. But by the grace of God, there is no sin you cannot overcome. Verse 3 then is horizontal honor. It's honor directed at my neighbors. When it says, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. King James says, who does not backbite with his tongue. And one of the signs of our fallen condition as men, mankind, is the tendency of speaking bad of people behind their backs. The test of how much you honor someone is how willing or unwilling you are to speak bad behind their back. Because one of these sins in our hearts, one of the major sins in our hearts is we are self-centered beings with an over-exaggerated sense of moral superiority to others. And nothing shows how fallen we are, like how easily we speak bad about people behind their back. Backbiting is rooted in the wickedness of a heart that says, I don't see your value. And I don't value you. So I can easily talk bad about you behind your back. And we see it in the current podcast industrial complex, particularly our black podcasts. And there's a lot of these ones rising up in South Africa. And it's just a relentless sewage spill of backbiting on a public platform where we just tear down one another. There's something in our sin nature which enjoys the feeling of talking bad about someone and pulling them down with our words. Why? Why do we do that? It's because underneath my backbiting is an evil, ugly, underlying hatred for the person I'm tearing down. And God is saying to us as Shaper's Church, a major part of worshiping is to allow the Holy Spirit to break through the evil hatred in our hearts that causes us to easily and happily and joyfully speak bad about people there are some people when they're talking bad they even go ha they, there's like there's a joy there's a joy an anointing of joy comes on them as they are tearing down somebody let's talk it, 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 even on the phone they can be whispering I hope they're not hearing and the first step to recovery from this sin is I first have to recognize the sinfulness of backbiting. A lot of us recognize the sinfulness of murder, the sinfulness of sexual sin. But when it comes to backbiting, we think it's no big deal. But I have to recognize how much God hates it when I speak bad about people behind their back. And how my backbiting kindles the holy wrath of a holy God against me. And that I need the Holy Spirit to help me break it. In this season, don't speak bad about nobody. Don't speak bad about nobody. Speak the gospel. In fact, pray for them. Pray for them. Verse 4 then is both vertical and horizontal in that it's dealing with the attitude of my heart as it relates to two scenarios. Firstly, verse 4 says, Who despise a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord? This scenario relates to the attitude of my heart in terms of the people I admire and whether I can discern if this person I admire is to be admired or not. Simply because... We're in a time where we like idolizing people. Particularly right now, I don't think in the history of mankind, we've seen the influence of celebrities. Particularly, American celebrities are extremely influential. 
American celebrities in sports, fashion, music, politics, movies, even now in Christianity, they have a lot of influence. But we have to be discerning enough to realize who should we see as an example and who should we see as a warning. Every person in the world is either an example or a warning. And many times we are prone to what psychologists call the halo effect where we put people on a pedestal based on their talent and ignore their character, ignore their values, ignore the ideologies that they are postulating. And part of worship is God looks in our hearts and sees who are your heroes. And whether or not you have a, the discernment to look past their talent and charisma and understand the underlying demonic ideologies that they are advocating for in the earth through their art and their oratory skills. A lot of our favorite celebrities today are promoting ideas and concepts that are in direct rebellion against God. Whether it's third wave feminism, whether it's the manosphere, whether it is gender theory, whether it's abortion, whether it's polyamory, whether it's sexual promiscuity, whether it's greed, whether it's um, drugs, whether it's atheism, whether it's humanism, witchcraft, sage, crystals, energies. We must be able to discern the demonic ideologies which people of influence are promoting in this age. And we must be able to discern and honor sound doctrine and the gospel versus extreme grossly unbiblical teaching or on a lighter side motivational TED talks that use the Bible as a tool for psychological therapy. Part of worship is growing in spiritual discernment to be able to discern the gospel, to be able to discern error, to be able to discern Satan working behind the scenes of celebrities and even churches. Yeah. Then in part C of verse 4, we see a level of spiritual maturity that comes from a life that is gospel-centered. When he says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts? Ooh. Many times our faithfulness in serving is based on reciprocity and performance. Yeah. One thing you learn in life is that many people are fallen and self-centered. Most people around you are takers and not givers. You're going to pour into many people who don't come back to pour back to you. Yeah. No, if Lillian Orwa, a Kenyan fashion CEO, said that the person you're making sacrifices for will one day turn around and tell you, I didn't ask you to, end quote. That's painful and true, and it can hurt. But gospel-centered maturity serves man as unto God. We keep our oath even when it hurts. We stay committed even when it causes pain. Why? Because we know someone who kept his oath even when it hurt. Jesus remained steadfast in his commitment to us. Even in the excruciating pain of the cross, with the wrath of God being poured out on him on our behalf, he willingly bore the weight of our sins and kept his promise to save us, even with fallen men today turning around and telling him, we didn't ask you to die for us. He hasn't broken his commitment to us. The reason why Jesus remained committed to us and endure the cross is because his commitment to us on the cross was not only subjective in its value in inspiring us to endure the pain for the gospel but greater than that what happened on the cross had objective value in that the cross is not merely an example for us of how to self-sacrifice it's not only an inspiration that should change us but the cross, on the cross, there was an objective change. Something happened. Something was done. 
something changed forever. It is what Anselm calls satisfaction of wrath. Uh, on the cross, there was a legal transaction which occurred, which has changed the status of the universe and of those who believe from being condemned to being justified. It's on that cross that Jesus propitiated the wrath of God. He satisfied it completely. He drank. He said, let this cup pass me by. But on the cross, he drank the cup of wrath completely. Hallelujah. Say he drank the cup. And there's not even a single drop of wrath left in that cup for those who believe. He has changed our status. And he has blessed us with the Holy Spirit. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit where we now objectively have a grace, have a divine enablement to endure pain and suffering. If the cross was just subjective, an example, we would not have the grace. But the gospel is objective. Something happened. And when we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit who is able to carry us in the hard places of life. He's able to carry us through grief. He's able to carry us through pain. He's able to carry us through rejection. He's able to carry us when money is tough. He's able to carry us when we are under pressure. The grace of the Holy Spirit holds us up. And we have grace-enabled endurance. Say we have grace-enabled endurance. Then verse 5 relates to how we use money. He says, who lends money to the poor without interest? It's speaking about how when we help the poor of those in need, we must do it without taking advantage of them, nor expecting something extra in return. And in many cases, expect nothing in return. When you help someone in need, don't do it and hold it against them for the rest of their life. Our sin nature, when we help people, we want to remind you, ah, I lent you 50 rand 10 years ago. I'm the reason you've now got that house. Are you hearing me here? We have a tendency of helping and wanting interest, wanting to claim from the people we've helped. When you help someone in need, do it because you know that you have been helped by God to pay a debt you could never pay. At the core of every Christian must be a willingness to help those in need and expect nada in return. Giving should never be an issue for the Christian, particularly for us in South Africa, surrounded by needs. We have to be willing to help. And even when we are needy, we have to still find a way to help. We mustn't postpone our giving to a time when we are successful. When I am rich, that's when I'll be generous. Help with a slice of bread. Help with a thank you. Help with encouragement. Everyone is able to help no matter what level you are in. Because giving is not a monetary issue. Giving is not an amount issue. Giving is a heart issue. Never miss an opportunity to give. The best time to give is when things are hard. Give away some shoes. Give away some clothes. Give, give away some books. Give away some pots. Some of you have got pots and pens you haven't used in 10 years. They're just there. Give them away to someone getting married. And then he says, who doesn't accept a bribe against the innocent? Which means... We don't bow the knee to money. We don't turn money into a God where we are willing to sin to get money. In Johannesburg, this city is dangerous. It's a materialistic city. People in this city love money. People in this city develop an identity around money. And there's people willing to sin to get money. When you're willing to sin to get money, money is your God. Money is your God. When you are willing to sin to get money, money is your God. And in the context of this text then, taking a bribe to influence, 
is taking a bribe from people of influence is to influence justice and oppress the innocent. And in Proverbs, you will learn that God hates bribery. He hates it when money influences justice and innocent people suffer, not based on the merits of their case, but based on a corrupt justice system. A lot of leaders in this country are going to face the Lord for corruption. The amount of children who've gone without, the amount of hospitals which are not working, the amount because of individuals who just love money. God hates it when money is used to oppress people. He hates it when money influences justice. He hates corrupt justice systems. And it's amazing that Jesus was a victim of a corrupt justice system. The religious leaders of Israel sentenced an innocent man to death. But it's through the greatest injustice in history that the justice of God against human sin was satisfied. Now us as men who were born guilty, deserving to die, can now receive mercy from God. And let's go to the outro as we close. Verse 5c. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. At this point, I have to indicate to you that in question one, where it says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The question right there is dealing with our greatest need. Our greatest need. What is the greatest need of man? Josh, you can come. The greatest need is fellowship with God. Amen. That's our greatest need. Amen. And after the fall, that was not possible because we were now born in sin, guilty of Adam's sin and corrupted by Adam's sin, which means we could no longer be in fellowship with God because of our greatest need and our greatest problem, which is sin. Our greatest problem is our sin, and sin makes it impossible for us to meet our greatest need, which is fellowship with God. So because of our sin, question one, who may dwell in your sacred tent? We are born disqualified. But through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God provided a way for us to live in his holy mountain and to fellowship with him. But this psalm is not about justification. It's about our sanctification. It's looking at the transformative impact of our fellowship with God. These verses are not a checklist of how we must try harder to earn our place in heaven. They are the fruit of being restored into right relationship with God. Because heaven has already been ushered into our hearts through Jesus Christ. So through Jesus Christ, we must now live a life of honoring God and honoring the people around us. And when we live that way, we receive divine fulfillment in our souls where we cannot be shaken anymore. You know what that means? <laughs> you enter the most powerful place on earth, which is the place of divine fulfillment, where right in your soul, in your soul, you are secure. I got a job, I'm secure. I've lost my job, I am secure. I got a great relationship, I'm secure. The relationship fell apart, I'm secure. I prayed and God answered, I'm secure. I prayed and it's not yet answered, I'm secure. Divine fulfillment, where I'm totally satisfied in God. Let's stand.